So without any further ado, I want to welcome back Sean Bryant, who I, I feel so proud to call my friend. Um, he is a former Head Start teacher and mental health consultant and is the founding director of Teaching Excellence Center. Sean has over 27 years of educational experience in urban, suburban, and rural school districts and early childhood settings. Much of Sean's work supports teachers, programs, and leaders in planning, visioning, implementing, and evaluating large-scale improvement initiatives. He is a national speaker, trainer, and consultant, and you can learn more about Sean by visiting his website, Teaching excellencecenter.com. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for being here. Again, we welcome you and appreciate your willingness to provide training for us today. Thanks. Take it away. Thank you, Beth, and good morning, everyone. I'm, I'm happy to be here, and I'm happy to see um, all of you here in the participant list that continues to grow, and those who have cut their screens on, and I see all of your um, faces alive and well. So that uh, oftentimes makes me happy. Beth, before we move forward, I just want to um, make fun of you a little bit. So you didn't read the TDW, Beth, because my bio has changed. I updated oh. this one. So next week, you're going to have to I'll have a different bio. Okay. Um, thank I can you, only thank do that you, to Sean. Beth because she, she knows um, she's a great colleague and friend of mine. So yeah. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> I'm going to share my screen and we're going to jump right in um, to this uh, brief learning time together uh, as, a, as a group. So just a second here, I have a bunch of monitors, so I have to move, move things around when I share my screen. So if you can see my shared screen, give me a thumbs up. Give me a thumbs up. Awesome. I see John, I see Sybil, I see Lorena. That is wonderful. So I've learned I had to check this. The other day I was on the Zoom and I got to like slide seven and someone said, Sean, I don't know what you're talking about. And I was like, what do you mean it's on the screen? And then they all said, we don't see what you see because uh, I hadn't shared the screen. So I've learned the hard way to start uh, double checking in, in this part Zoom world. So welcome to our, our um, short but meaty session on the development to the appropriateness of behaviors that challenge. And I specifically made it an awkward name because I wanted the development to the appropriateness piece to be in there. And at the same time, um, I wanted to you know, have a spotlight behaviors that change to move away from challenging behavior and for us to really get that this is gonna be about if we ground ourselves in development to the appropriate practice as practitioners and as parents, for people who work with children and families, uh, the outcomes are different. And we, we know that to be to be true. So because Beth won't be undone, Beth put the bio in the chat box. Beth, you're so I, I love you so much, Beth. So um, for those who don't know me, I'm Sean Bryant. And this is my, ooh, I need to update this slide. This is my 29th year in early childhood um, education. Um, just a little bit about me on the, on the screen. Um, I'm a former preschool teacher, center director, a manager, state analyst, and mental health consultant, among some other things. And what you just see on the screen is pieces that ground me in this work, things that no matter what I'm doing, if I'm training, coaching, consulting, working on a short-term project for three months with the company or agency or school district, or working on a two-year project, these are things that guide my work and all I do around being culturally responsive and social, social or cultural learning. Um, I am a Montessorian, so I take that into everything I do around order. I firmly, firmly believe in family center practice. I do value child center practice, and I know that's what we learn, but we've got to get into the 21st century to realize that if we're family centered, what that really means around serving children and families and how it is fundamentally a little bit different, not contradictory, but different than simply being child centered and how being child centered can ultimately push us to be in um, non-culturally responsive. Um, so, but this isn't that training, but I just like to spot like that. And of course, ABAR is what I do, anti-bias and anti-racist teaching and learning. It's an ongoing and continuous process that's never done. Um, it's done when I stop breathing in this dimension. Uh, I'm really into personality development, 
you know, in, in terms of coaching. And I really, really believe in inclusion. And I believe in inclusion as action, not inclusion as a statement, not inclusion saying, oh, we have an inclusion program, but action that is something we do every single day in our work with young children, families, and adults. Um, and I believe in teacher voice. I think in this work in early childhood, if the teacher's voice isn't brought into the room, then we fundamentally started off in the wrong way. Um, and I believe in leadership at all levels, from children being leaders to parents, families, teachers, colleagues, family service specialists, coaches, directors, and community members, abuelitas, tias, grandmoms, omas, that we all have leadership capacities and capabilities. And it's our part of our job to make sure that we're spotlighting that and bringing that in. So that was just my short intro. And of course, I encourage you to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, um, and the YouTube page. I'm starting to put more and more videos up there um, as I uh, have time and opportunity. So it's a great place, place to know um, uh, not just what I'm doing, but small bits of PD that I'm putting up there in different forms. So if you're on social media, uh, I encourage you to show up. In this virtual learning process, we're gonna do three things. In this short amount of time, we're gonna raise awareness about developmentally appropriate practice, meaning the new addition. Some of you who've been in this work may have heard about it, but there's some current changes that just came out. Um, we're gonna learn some new skills and you're gonna have an opportunity to practice, or uh, I like to say be reflective and reflexive with those new skills. So before we jump right in, I'm gonna encourage you all to get a pencil, pen, crayon marker, and some paper to um, write with and take some notes as we move forward, because I think this will help you to um, participate in the small groups and to give you the opportunity to uh, jot down things that are important to you. I've created our community agreements um, just to guide us in this group work. I want you all to speak openly. You can unmute yourselves um, by raising your hand. I want you to bring your experience and wisdom because there are hundreds of years of experience if we added it up here. Um, I want you to be thinking about your role and responsibility towards teachers, if, you're, if you are a teacher or not a teacher, and towards children and families, but specifically towards children, and this notion of behavior um, uh, as something that we learn, but seems to be still difficult and contentious for us in, in this work. And I want us to be open to new ways of knowing, new ways of knowing about behavior, new ways of understanding, and not lastly, but also the focus on some take backs. What are you gonna take back to your work as a practitioner, what are you gonna take back to your work as an administrator? What will you take back to your work as a parent, you know, as an aunt, as an uncle, as someone involved in the lives of our youngest citizens who are young children? And of course, we're using the chat box today to um, share our voices also, multiple ways to en engage. We just ask that if you share in the chat box, make sure that we stay on topic. Um, so sometimes we get, carried away and we start sharing in the chat box and it starts to become something completely different. Um, and we just wanna make sure that in a short period of time, we keep our focus um, on the topic. All right, so we're gonna jump right in. And we're gonna jump in by um, having you meet some folk. So you are going to go into some breakout rooms for about 12 minutes. I'm gonna put like three of you in rooms together, if I can get this right. All right, so there'll be three people in each room. So they're gonna do three things in that breakout room. So if your camera isn't on, when you get there, cut your camera on. It would be good to cut your camera on now if you can. Um, and then when you get into the chat, your breakout room, cut your mic on so you can all talk to each other. But you're gonna to respond to three questions. You're gonna name things that children do that challenge adults. So you're gonna do that with the other two people in your, your breakout room. The second question you're gonna grapple with is, what are some things you hope for children to have when they become adults? So those children who are two, three and four um, and five who may demonstrate behaviors that challenge you but get their needs met, imagine them as a full grown adult. What are some things that you hope for that child? And the third question is, how are you intentional about supporting those young children in becoming the adult 
that you want them to become? How are you intentional as a teacher, as a parent, or an adult involved in the lives of young children to um, become those adults? All right. So I am going to open the breakout rooms now. You may need to click into the breakout room and then I'll start the countdown clock and then I'll send you all a message when there's one minute left and that one minute gives you a one minute countdown before you all get pushed back to the main room. Enjoy. How long will they be in the room, Sean? 12 minutes. 12 minutes, thank you. All the rooms are closed, so it looks like everyone's back. So welcome back, welcome back. Thank you all for that. And in full transparency, I, I lied. I took four minutes of your breakout room away. Um, I was tracking, so for those who were counting, I, I admit it, I admit it. Um, but welcome back. So let's see if there's a, a brave soul who wants to unmute themselves and share um, quickly what your group talked about around naming things that children do that challenge adults. Maria, it looks like you unmuted yourself. You want to speak? Oh, I was just going to tell you that I I, I, <laughs> I, I did say, oh, 12 minutes, is, is that's it? I mean, you know, but I didn't know that it was that. Right, right. Thank you. <laughs> yes. I mean, we had a, you know, we had a discussion about, you know, children, how they behave in a, in, at home and how they behave in school settings. Mm -hmm. But did you unmute and, the behaviors that challenge adults? Well, yes. Like for example, I, you know, just this is just an example. Like you know, at, at home, children have the capability to understand how much they can push their parents at home, and then at, in school, what they do to get you know what they want from the teachers. But when you when you when you um, look at the the scenarios, each one is different. For example, I do have a three and a half year old. And, and at home, you know, um, for example, there are children nowadays, they're very involved in technology. So if I gave him the iPad or tablet, and you know, if when I want him to um, give me back, he always um, starts arguing with me and he says three more minutes, you know, and I, and I say, um, no, you know, no, that's it, it's done, three more minutes. But I talked with the group, I said, you know, they're so persistent. And they know that at some point I'm gonna say, okay, fine, three more minutes, you know? So, uh, because they have that kind of capability and they are very smart and like, that's a home, like an example of a home setting with their parents. Um, but when it comes to school, you know, when they're in school setting and I've seen it all the time, you know, children want different things at school. And for example, if they're having an argument with an, one child having an argument with another child over a toy, they, and then a the teacher intervenes, these children will give you so many, um, you know, um, explanation of why they want that toy. Why mm -hmm. is it important for him or her to have that toy, you know? And um, so, so they know how to express themselves and how to talk about it and how to get it. Uh, they have that skill of understanding yeah. of like, what are my limits at home? What are my limits in the school and how much I can push. And um, so that's something that, that, you know, I've seen it. Awesome. Thank you. So and Jacqueline, I see your hand is up. Um, do you want to, um, can you, did your group name some things that children do that challenge adults? Or was that an accident? I see your hands raised, Jacqueline. No, it wasn't an accident. I thought I had unmuted myself. I'm still okay. learning tech. But anyway, um, one of the things that we talked about, I have a, um, I have a problem with children hurting other children. Okay, so hurting other children. All okay, right. that mm -hmm. was the behavior we. That was one behavior we talked about. Another behavior that we talked about was excluding. Um, excluding. I, yeah, Miss um, Garillo had mentioned that, and um, the other person who we talked about. She talked about um, finding a boundary. Kids find having having a problem of of wanting to assert themselves. Um, so those were three um, three different behaviors that we talked about. Um, what I liked about what Miss Gar Miss Garrio said is how how she tries to work on getting the kids to ex 
to include being inclusive is by finding a, um, a common denominator that each child likes and focusing on that. When I talked, when I talked about behavior, um, we talked, I talked about, you know, um, the um, emotional literacy, trying to get the kids to, you know, breathe, trying to um, get them to, uh, um, to label the feelings that they had. So those were the things that we talked about. Thank you, Jacqueline. Did you all answer this question? Some things that you all hope for children to have when they're adults? Uh -huh. One of the things I did say is for them to be able to have self-regulation. Okay. That was. Did you all define self-regulation? You're talking about some real great things here, um, Jacqueline. You all maybe had, you probably didn't define it though, did you? You didn't define self-regulation? No, I, other than than being able to um, to contain negative feelings and being able to learn how to internalize those so they can um, um, be maybe the best person they can be. That's okay. So the aspects of the low hanging fruit of self read. All right. Did you all answer this one, Jacqueline? How are you intentional about supporting children to become adults? Other than what I named about how um, how we work through inclusion, okay. So that was one of the things how how we fight against being exclude excluding folks by looking for um, my battery is running low. I'm have to. Okay, okay. Uh, no, so. you, you, you're, you're on you're on the you're on this track because you actually are connecting some of what your group talked about. In terms of this exclusion piece, we're going to talk about next week in the friendship and peer session because those are two big pieces that um, either deter children from becoming friends instead of helping them to become friends. And then this notion of self-regulation, I just want to put it out there because we're talking about behavior because we don't talk about it this way enough. Even in our wonderful California state standards, it's written where it gives the vast majority of the responsibility to developing young children around self-regulation. And I think this is what gets us in trouble. And this is how children ended up getting get sus suspended and expelled and teachers become stressed. If you get nothing else, self-regulation is social and self-control is individualized. So let me explain what I mean by that, or what Dr. Stuart Schenker in his research says, that self-regulation self is a social phenomena that children do with a regulated adult. So if you look at that picture there, that kid's doing it with that regulated adult. That's a regulated adult who's with that child. That's a regulated adult who's with that child in all three pictures. Self-regulation is social, meaning children don't do it by themselves. They learn to become self-regulated over time through multiple, multiple. And when I mean multiple, I mean every single day for the, you know, the first eight years of their lives around this notion of self-regulation. So it is a social phenomenon we gain self-control through multiple opportunities to self-regulate with the self-regulated adult. So parent, teacher, telling children to do it, we end up telling them to do it all year and they don't gain the skill. When we do it with them, we help them to gain that skill of self-regulation, which actually supports behavior. So um, thank you all. Thank you for sharing so much, um, Jacqueline. So Jacqueline, you're actually our first winner of the day. You win an Amazon gift card. So here's what I've changed, Jacqueline. I used to say, you know, send me your email. Then I got to run people down to give away my money. I stopped that. My therapist told me, you're crazy. Stop that. Because I brought it up in therapy one time. So what you have to do, Jacqueline, if you want it, because you may not want it, is my email, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, teachingexcellencecenter.com. It's on every single screen. You email me. I'll email you the e-gift card. If you don't email me, that means you're giving it to the universe and we'll keep trucking. Congratulations, Jacqueline. Let's give her a, a virtual congratulations. All right, let's jump in. We got some work to do. So this notion of developmentally appropriate practice. So we oftentimes call it DAP. This is a concept that was created back in the 80s. Developmentally appropriate practice, DAP, all right? Um, it's a concept that's grounded in research that looks at three broad things child development, learning, and educational effectiveness. So this first piece of depth being grounded in child development, 
That means those of us who are early childhood practitioners or even parents, it is really important that we understand typical and atypical development, meaning the stages of development. That means if we don't know that very well as a parent, we reach out the first five and we say, I need some help from Help Me Grow. Or if it's a Head Start program, we say, you know, can the family service specialist, are you all providing a family workshop that we get the knowledge and the knowledge is everywhere around the child and what they should be able to know how to do so that I'm, I'm matching my expectation as an adult with their age and development as a child. Because oftentimes when that's mismatched, we what end up with what we call challenging behaviors and we blame it on the child or children, but it's really us because our expectation is not grounded in child development. These are all the pieces that prevent children from percolating up and then us saying, oh, these behaviors. The next piece of depth is this notion of learning. So we used to say, you know, children learn different things at home and they learn different things at school. So this notion of learning, learning is really about the decisions that we as adults make. I'll say that again. Learning is about decisions that we as adult make, adults make. That if I'm a parent, a caregiver, a teacher, we're always making decisions that are either developmentally appropriate or sometimes they're developmentally inappropriate. But children are learning in all of those settings. So we need to understand how to elevate the learning experiences because they're grounded in developmentally appropriate practice, specifically around our notion of social emotional learning or i.e. behavioral expectations for young children. The third big piece that I wanna share with you all is um, this notion of educational effectiveness. And this actually has three parts to it. The first part is this caring community of adults. And we're gonna get into these later. Parents and teachers development and learning, because we've got to learn some things to give it to children. How do we plan for children to achieve goals at home or at school or in a play group? assessing their development and learning. That's largely through our observation. And then the fifth part, which should be the first one, is establishing from the door reciprocal relationships with all the adults in children's lives. So if I'm a parent or a family member, I need to develop that relationship with Jacqueline Jones, who's that you know preschool teacher. If I'm the preschool teacher and Sean is being raised by his aunt Darlene, I need to develop a relationship with her. Whoever the adults are in their lives, those relationship building must become reciprocal to support developmentally appropriate practice. Fundamentally, fundamentally important. And the reason why we're talking about that around parents and teachers is because what we've learned, this is current research from 2021, because at the beginning of the pandemic, there were some people that were funded to study what was happening to children and families. And what we found in the last 12 months was that there's these things called constrained in unconstrained learning. So what we found was we used to think that it was constrained learning. Guess who um, teaches constrained learning? Teachers and educators. We used to value that saying that this is the way children learn. But guess what we found? That unconstrained learning that children get from home actually has a greater effectiveness. So it's just both and not either or. That this notion of children aren't learning anything at home and their behaviors are gonna be worse. It's not true that unconstrained and constrained learning both have value. So then here's an, a quick example. Constrained learning is we read the book from front to back. Constrained learning is we read the words on the page. Constrained learning is I teach you the alphabet in order. Unconstrained learning is we, we talk about books. We look at, we may open the book and start at the fifth page right? Still handling the book, still talking about the book, but it's unconstrained, meaning it's not so rigid. And that those experiences are developmentally appropriate and children can get them from their families. And what we found around social emotional development is those children who needed more time to grow in that area, they're not going to show up with those problem behaviors because of their experiences with unconstrained learning. Yeah, um, Martina, it's go to early, oh, is it Early Learning Network, Early Learning Nation? There are two of them. It's, it's, it's all right there. It's all right there. Um, this notion of adult voice. So teacher Tina and her class have been studying how to interplay experiences. Many of the children have been pushing 
shoving, and some hidden scream during play. She started teaching them emotion words to describe what they feel. Here's the benefit, and Jacqueline, you were getting at this. The benefit of teaching emotion words isn't just so I can emote. Here's the piece that we miss and that we've got to help our colleagues, our programs, and families get. When you teach me to say, Beth, I'm frustrated. Beth, I'm sad. Beth, I'm scared. What immediately happens to my limbic system is if I was actually going down into the stress zone and my cortisol level was getting higher, when I can say, because Beth's taught me a variety, not just mad, sad, glad, and happy, but a variety of feeling words. And I say, Beth, I'm scared. And Beth leans in because she's responsive. And she says, tell me about it, Sean. Not what are you scared about? Because I may not be able to describe it that way. Tell me about it, Sean. And I just mumble some stuff off to her. What immediately happens is my brain begins to calm down my sensory experience because I begin to name what it is I've taken in. This is why emotion words are so important. And I, some of you have heard me say this, I'm a witness before I actually got deeper into doing that for myself. I was that adult who would like raise my voice and tell you how I felt and what you were gonna do and what you weren't gonna do. Now, when I'm at meetings and people say things that I dislike, I can say, wow, I'm I start talking to myself. And what I know is when I do it, I calm down. I feel sometimes my chest gets so tight in some of these meetings and I start giving myself some self-talk and I feel my chest begin to what loosen up. So my behavior shifts. We can give that to children early and often, but most time we can't give it to them because we've never practiced it. So a parent's perspective, Scott's family is worried he is not going to be prepared for kindergarten, this contentious conversation, because the teacher is spending lots of time, um, that should be on, lots of time um, on socializing. Miguel is four years old and his parents are worried. So when we reflect on this, if you were gonna to go to your group, and I'm not gonna put you into a group because I'm paying attention to time. Um, you reflect on your role in your program and your agency and how might you respond to um, Scott's family. And I want some of you to think about that. And if you think of something that you wanna share, put it in the chat box. But here's really that adult's response to their family around children gain some fundamental things when they play in a variety of ways, not in constrained ways, but in unconstrained ways that have a direct effect on behavior. I'm practicing the skills you want me to have. Some kids may only need to practice it a hundred times. Other kids like Sean may need to practice that same skill a thousand times to get it. It's all developmentally appropriate. It doesn't mean I need a red folder. It doesn't mean I need to see the psychologist. It doesn't mean I have ineffective bad parents. You know, it doesn't mean I'm being whooped and beat at home. It just means my development requires something different in that area. Because here's the thing, and we're gonna to get to this. We all get tricked around behavior, but if you put me in the room with Beth and we're teaching us both the, the alphabet and Beth needed more time, you would just give Beth more time. You wouldn't say, I don't know, it's the first month of school and Beth hasn't learned those alphabets, but we do that around behavior and social emotional development. In no other domain do we do that. This notion of learning how to take turns and use language becoming friendly and making friends, which is a hallmark, and we're gonna get into that next week, that children need to do on their own. Adults can help support it, but we don't set it up. Um, this notion of naming feelings and over time being able to regulate over time. I mean, deal with what Jacqueline said, she said the negative pieces, but to deal with the demands of the situation and the stress, play is actually probably the best, what I, the best what I call elixir or antidote to all of those things, unconstrained play. Um, so that point for us is how often are we allowing children to play at home in our community and at school? So if your school is open from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m., but Sean really only gets, what, 45 minutes of real play. I've been here all day, but I really only have 45 minutes to play. And you wonder why my behavior is percolating up. This slide really just looks at what children gain at school and at home when they play. At school, it's usually in small groups. At home, it could be individually or with the support of adult. You know, at school, we're usually listening to stories being told, constrained learning. At home, we sometimes begin to tell stories, unconstrained learning. At school, we oftentimes meet in the whole group. At home, it may look like I'm wandering around, but I'm learning, I'm looking at what's in my house. Do I see reflections of myself? Am I talking to my elders, my older cousins? 
at school, we work on things. At home, we're typically working out things. And sometimes what happens is the stuff that I'm working out at home, I come to school and I start working it out at school because not to scare you preschool teachers, but your preschool room is nothing but a very large group therapy play space. Think about that when you think about behavior. That is set up just like a play therapy room to pull out all that stuff that's in children. The only thing is Sean isn't there by himself. You got Sean, Jose Miguel, Derek, Maria, Nevea, Heaven. You got 24 of us and not just one. Think about that, baby. And then we participate in routines. This all happens, what, in the context of play. So here's how that adult responds to Scott's family. Um, it may look just like they're playing, but there's a structure and a plan when the adult is intentional in their classroom or at home, in the play group, or wherever that child is, is spending time. Um, and oftentimes the adult who don't understand that has to come and observe to gain some understanding about it. So Gagan sent me a question, but they sent it directly to me. So this is a right. What about students who come to classrooms from dysfunctional homes, unsafe environments? We're gonna get, that's gonna be the last chunk of this session, Gavin. So if you can stay with us, we're gonna cover those things in the last chunk around those strategies. I really needed to cover in the beginning, the development to the appropriate piece, because we sometimes push this out the window when it comes to behavior. And we forget that this should be what's guiding us in this ongoing and continuous way. Um, and I just appreciate the, the latest edition. So the, one of the pieces in the latest edition of development to appropriate practice. And you can Google it online at NAYC and you can get the 40 page document for free as a PDF in English and in Spanish. But we've moved away and then there's an equity statement. We've moved away finally, um, and let's see how long this takes for the rubber to hit the road around this notion of best practice. Because we used to say there's a best practice you know, to teaching. There's a best, best practice to reading. There's a best practice to behavior and being with children. Now what we've said is, you know what, this best practice thing has messed us up. Because in this country, what we were really saying without saying it was best practice is you need to look like, smell like, and feel like Reggio inspired. And anything less than that, you were not best practice. This is what we're really doing. So we were really taking that frame to define best practice. So the latest edition says there is no best practice. There's quality practices. And that quality practices look a variety of ways, meaning there are multiple ways to read a book effectively, not one, not two, but multiple ways. There are multiple ways to respond to the same challenging behavior that's culturally developmentally appropriate. It's not child abuse, but there are multiple ways to do that. So that's written there so that we need to get there. And at the same time, there are people who are saying, no, this is the way we should do that. So we still have that fight, but I'm grounded in research. So a lot of what we do in early childhood is about people, how we feel. And then we bring that into our profession around, this is how I feel. I'm not challenging how you feel, but how you feel may not work for me and my family and the children I serve. Research works. And that's what we're doing today. We're not just talking about anything. We're talking about years and years and decades of research in science that we've built upon. So you may be saying, okay, so I've heard this term before. I thought I understood it, Sean. So what is developmentally appropriate practice? So what is that? It's a few things. This concept en encapsulates a few things. It's based on research that's effective that you know we used to call best practice. It's based on adults who are tuned to children's uniqueness as individuals, which means you can't teach me as my parent, as a family member, as my teacher, as the aide, if you don't know me. You've got to tune to who I am and what my developing needs are. Some of us used to think, oh, developmentally appropriate practice is just child-centered and making things easy for children, 100% incorrect. Developmentally appropriate practice at home and at school means you present me with a challenge, but you make sure that that challenge is achievable, which means it's not so far beyond me, but that I can do it. Here's what it looks like. So right before the pandemic started, it was probably October of 2019. I was in Oakland at a Head Start program. It's, I was um, their consultant, so I was there for a, a number of months all day because um, that was part of the contract. So I had two little boys who were in the preschool. We we had. They had a really large yard. Um, so we had, they had went in the kitchen to help me like carry some stuff to the yard. And one of them 
when we were walking, he picked up an empty spray bottle. You know, we put water and paint and things in there and he brought it to the yard. He filled it up with water. Another little boy came and he snatched it from him. These are one of those moments where I felt like, oh, I should have had a camera attached to me because it was just so crucial. Um, so he snatched it from him and went to the tree and started spraying the tree and he was spraying ants on the tree. So the little boy he snatched it from, he came to me and he said, he snatched it. I saw the whole thing and I said, I saw that. He said, what are you gonna do? He was looking at me like, I want you to go tell him to give it back to me. That's not what I'm gonna do in this challenging behavior. What are you gonna do? He said, I'm gonna go ask for it. I said, go ask for it. He went over there and he said, I had that, give it back. The little boy said, no. He ran back over, no, I'm standing probably four feet behind him. He ran back to me and he said, he said, no. I said, well, what else can you say to him? He said, I'm gonna go ask him to take turns. Now, mind you, at this point, he's going back the second time. There are three more children watching and listening. He runs back over there and he says, let's take turns, let's share. No, he comes back over to me. What happened? He said, no. So he doesn't want to share. He won't give it to you. He doesn't want to take turns. So those are three things you asked him to do. What else could you do? Classic four-year-old behavior because he's out of ideas. So he looks at me like this. Snatch it from him. <laughs> like, but to me, it was like, that is an option, right? That is an option. He's like, okay, I just tried all the things that I know that are what appropriate. The only other thing I know to do is to go back over and snatch it from him. I said, so we can't snatch it. What else could you do? He's looking at me like, he's looking down on the ground like, I'm really out of ideas. Now, mind you, the other kids are there. I said, does anyone else know what he can do? I'm running through all the things that he did. While we're engaged in the conversation, he comes away from the tree, spray bottle in hand. We're by the water fountain. He puts more water in it and he gives it to him. He says, here, you can have it. I said, he gave it to you. I said, well, what else can you tell him? He said, well, I filled it up with water so now that you can go spray. Now, some of us would have handled that differently. We would have said, wait a minute. You snatched it from him, he picked it up, give it back. This all happened in less than two minutes. Had I intervened differently, I would have robbed them both of what? That experience. So this notion of it being challenging but achievable, because I was there to help them what? Regulate, they were both able to what? Have a different outcome. That was largely me deciding not to tell him to give it back. That was largely me deciding to wait with him, not to say, well, wait and see what happens and walk away. I was there the whole time. Because had I walked away, he probably would have went and snatched it from him and we would have had an incident. But I stayed there and in less than two minutes, he gave it back. And it wasn't peer pressure. It was that other thing where he had that developing skill that we only get through repetition. That's that challenging yet achievable space that sometimes we don't afford children um, in this sometimes difficult work. So how do we know if our interactions are developmentally appropriate? I just gave you one example, but it depends on our modeling. It depends on our language. It depends on our engagements. It depends on our verbal and nonverbal um, communication. It depends on the environment and the materials, the people, the other children. So largely developmentally appropriate practice says it depends. That's how we know if it's developmentally appropriate. Because remember, quality practices don't look one way, which is why we don't call them best practices anymore. It depends because they look a variety of ways. So let's quickly unpack come with some of what I just talked to you about. This notion of us as adults. And we can think about this ongoing. This, this is one of your action plans for this school year. How do you as an adult Think about things that are challenging yet achievable for young children. A lot of people who are teachers say, oh, this is a scaffold. This is a scaffold. This is, this is a scaffold. And I say, well, wait a minute. Let's not name it that. Let's not jump to scaffolding because most of us don't even scaffold well. Let's think about each and every experience as individual and what aspect of that could be challenging for one or a group of children and how is it going to be achievable? Meaning the challenge is not beyond me and I feel worse, but the challenge is what close to me so that it's goal achieving regarding my behavior. That's the point there that you have to think about. So Talon says we have to look at it differently for them to deal with it differently. That's definitely true. Um, Talon said we have to regulate to help them regulate, definitely. 
The next part around these practices are how responsive are these practices, not necessarily to you and the other adult, but to the child's social and cultural context. How responsive is the practice to them around that? I was just at a classroom, because um, I'm going back into classrooms physically, and uh, the operations manager who functions sometimes as the assistant director, you know, she pulled me in the hallway and ended up talking to me for 28 minutes. And I was like, I need to get to another meeting that I literally was late for. But you know, you have to let people share and talk. But she was really talking about this. She said, you know, the mental health consultant that comes, you know, the teachers just have a hard time connecting with them. And then she went on and on and on. And essentially she was saying that these pieces don't work for the adults or the children around other supports. What she really wanted me to do is to go back and tell other people, this is how they feel. And I wasn't gonna do that. I kind of gave her a structure for maybe you can talk to them in this way. But this is really, really important to people because it's often the unnamed invisible aspects of how we attune to children, how we respond to behavior and what we expect of behavior. And sometimes we think that is developmentally inappropriate when we don't know enough about the child and the family, um, which is why that rich piece of getting to know children and families first and foremost is what I always encourage people to do. I was just with First Baptist Head Start yesterday um, for a number of hours. And that was one of the things that I talked with them about. And then on Monday, I was um, with a Head Start program in South Carolina, Gleams Head Start. And the same thing came up in both sessions. And they were totally different topics, but this notion of the first 45 days of Head Start, what are you gonna do? And the teacher started listing all these things. And I said, if you do all of this in the first 45 days, your children are gonna have so many problems that you won't be able to solve until maybe April when you stop caring. So I said, don't do any of that. The first 45 days of school is all about what? Consistency and routines. Because if you don't get that down in the first 45 days, you're gonna be doing that the rest of the year. It's not about alphabets and letters. You got the rest of your life to do that. It's about the routines that you show up every day on time, ready to receive them, getting to know families, having those small, what I call lightning coach conversations with families doing drop off and pick up or during the day. Then by the middle of what, October, that's when we can drill down deeper. Your lesson plan in August and September should just be around how, you how are you teaching them to navigate that social space? Because when we don't do that, you end up with lots of what you call challenging behavior. And we don't realize you really just got about nine children who don't know what to do because this is their first time in group care. They're used to what? Their grandmother, their mother, their father holding their hand and taking them somewhere. Now you're telling me to get up and do it. I don't know what Miss Jackie wants because the little girl in the blue jacket was sitting beside me on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. Now this Thursday and she's not here. Miss Jackie doesn't realize that the last three days I literally just follow her. I didn't know what to do next because she's using words that I never heard. I was following her. Now that she's not here, I don't know what the hell to do. So because I don't know what to do, I just sit there. The other little kid, what, walks past me and kicks me. I push him. Then Miss Jackie tells my mother, you know, Miss Denise, Mr. James, Sean pushed the kids and then they fell down. Totally out of context. Because nobody knows that. I don't know what the hell to do. She thinks I know the routine because it's Thursday and I came to school Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. I'm not going to really internalize that, what, until the rest of the month, until next month. So we sometimes cause those behaviors without realizing that we can do some things differently by making what piffs and shivets. The other part that we need to help parents get is this notion of experiences and goals that we often think of goals as things that we bring into the classroom, but parents can have goals too for their children at home that complement and meet our goals at school. They don't have to be done the same way. Remember, constrained and unconstrained but those experiences can be shared to help children reach progress around behavior, around behavior. So if Sean doesn't like to what, wait, I can't delay gratification or take turns, you can have that conversation with my parent, not to say, you know, shake your finger at him, but to say, you know, at school, you know, we're putting him in small groups where he has to share, where there are only three crayons, but they're four kids. And we purposely set that up in the small group so that they, they have to share with each other and get that experience. So if you can do things like that at home, we can help them gain more experiences. That's what it's about. That's what makes it developmentally appropriate. And of course, I just gave you that. It's even behavior. 
Because oftentimes when we think of progress and my interests, we don't think of it as attached to what a child's behavior. And this is really that child development piece here, the knowledge, parenting and teaching effectiveness, we've got to have knowledge. As my brother said, my oldest nephew is now, he just graduated from high school and I can remember when he was born. Um, I was actually working in San Mateo County. I was the children's services manager for the Institute in Human and Social Development. And my oldest nephew was born and who is now 18 and just graduated from college. Um, and in the last three months crashed two cars, but that's a whole nother issue. Um, and then he had the audacity to say, could he have my car? If you all could hear what I said in my head, I just kind of smiled and said, I don't think so, nephew. But that's not what I really thought. <laughs> I was thinking, you just crashed your mom's car and your dad's car. You are not getting the keys to my effing car, little boy, because you don't clearly know how to drive yet. Um, but I didn't say that. I just said, no, nephew, not just yet, not just yet. Um, but years ago, when my brother, you know, they first had their first child and they were excited, and I came home during the holiday. My nephew was probably almost a year old, and I was trying to give him some advice. My brother turned around in a loving way that he has always done. And he said, you know, I know you do this for a living, but I'm learning on the job. I'm going to make some mistakes, and I'm probably not going to do it the way you think I should do it, but I'm learning on the job. And that was all I needed to kind of back off and say, you know what? Parenting is learning on the job. And he was giving himself the grace that said, you all are giving me advice and it's overwhelming. I need to figure this out on my own and in my own space. That's a level of effectiveness. So if we can meet families there, we help them to what? Mitigate behavioral problems. Because oftentimes what we do is we say, your child's demonstrating this behavior. Here are the three things that you should do. And in that, here's what we do. We overwhelm the parent. And this is research. If this were a trauma training, I would dive deep into this. We overwhelm the parent and then the parent, what, takes it out on the child and says, you know what, teacher Sean would not be saying this to me if your behavior changes. So we actually create a rupture between parent and child based on the information that we share with the parent because the parent doesn't have the skill set yet to do what we're telling them they need to do. We create the behavior challenges sometimes. We do it. All right, I'm moving fast here, Beth. We've got an hour left. I was going to let them take a break now, but I'm going to give them the break in just another minute, Beth, because I want them to do one more thing before the break. So sounds good. Would you say, Beth? Said it sounds good. All right. Because I'm, I'm paying attention to the time, so it's been an hour, and Beth knows that usually every hour I make people take a break and get about your seat and move around because it's good for our bodies and our health when we're on Zoom. So this notion of adult learners. So we're going to talk about the adult as a learner, the child as a learner, and the environment, all affecting behavior. So as the adult, we're responsible at home and at school for the environment. That is ultimately our responsibility. What we bring in, what we leave out, what we add, what we take away, how we set it up, all has a direct effect on not just one child, but all children. Part of our responsibility and role is to know my child and to know children. Here's the other part, knowing my child and knowing children, when that parent tells you, Sean doesn't do that at home. And you think, yes, he does. He's doing this everywhere he goes. I used to be that teacher. I used to say, oh, he's doing this everywhere. He's doing this in church. He's doing this at the synagogue. He's doing this at the zoo. He's doing this downtown. He's doing this on the step. And then I really started learning and realized, you know what? Children actually compartmentalize. He's not doing this at home. He's doing it here because there's some people at home that he can't do that around. So I start believing it. So we've got to know children in the context and conditions through which they show up with us and not the context and conditions through which they show up with other people. And it was a four-year-old little girl who helped me understand that the beauty of compartmentalization, that what I'm teaching them at school around, we don't hit, we use the peace table. And then she told me, my grandmother said, if somebody hit me, I can hit them back. What am I to do? I had to figure out oh, she's learning two sets of rules. So when I say the rules here or the expectations, I need to talk about school and know that child as an individual and not try to invalidate what her family has told her. It took me years to understand that and to get that. Our role is to make a match between each child and the children in our care and their experiences, what we afford them, 
That's our role. So my godchildren, who are now nine, six, and three, all have lived together their whole lives, same parents, but are fundamentally different. My godson, who was now nine, up until he was five, I didn't really like him that much. I didn't. It was at his fifth birthday where I think it was the spirit of the Lord just said, Sean, you got to change your ways about this little boy. It was at his birthday party that everything began to change. And we have a really great relationship now. But with him, if I say I'm going to do something, I have to just take him and we go do it. He, don't, he can't bring his two sisters or he taps out. Now, his middle sister, she can say, oh, you told me we were going to go to the ice cream place so I can get some strawberry ice cream. I said, okay, we can go. She's going to say, can my brother and my sister come? Individually different. Individually different around the same experience. I've got to know that match between who wants company, who doesn't want company, who doesn't, who, which one doesn't want company, who wants to sit and talk about being a nine-year-old, who wants everybody to get a new box of crayons and everybody to get what? Um, a coloring book, they're all different around their interests and what they need. And it affects behavior. It affects behavior. What does each child need? And what do I need to know to help them to get those needs met? Here's the big, big piece. This is the lift for us. And we're going to get some of this at the very end. We've got to take various, various strategies as parents and teachers in responding to behavior. Because most of us respond the way we were parented in the way we were what taught. Now, I'm not talking trash about your mother, your auntie, or your tia, your oma, or your big mama, but some of the stuff she may have taught you only applies at home. Don't bring that to your workplace because you might get fired around how you respond to children's behavior. This is the reality, and most of us bring that unconsciously and don't know it. I'm the first to admit, when I first started teaching, I used to say all the time there was jumper, some of these kids just need a good old fashioned spanking. I said that out of my mouth and I'm sharing it with you now. I used to say it to her at lunch break, some of these kids just need a good old fashioned spanking. And I said it as a new teacher because I didn't have any other knowledge and skills. I just thought that would fix this behavior. But what I was doing was essentially moving myself out of the equation. They're with me from eight to four. This was when Head Start was only running from eight to four. Some of y'all remember that. It wasn't all day. You, everybody showed up at eight o'clock. Everybody left at four, four thirty. Those were the good old days. They're gone forever. Bye bye. But we literally would sit and talk. I had to develop skills to say, "Oh, I've got to teach them some things when they're here around behavior, and not blame their families, not blame their parents, not blame their communities, but take accountability of putting what more skills in my toolbox." And those skills had to be grounded in what developmentally appropriate practice for me to go deeper. Now, those skills will vary from person to person based on who you are, um, what programs your uh, program uses, what curriculum your program uses, how you're receiving children. You may be a social worker who sees small groups of children. So what skills you use have to be really discrete skills. You may be a preschool teacher who every three years, you all are taking on a new curriculum. You're getting retrained on something. So there's this ongoing process that drives everybody crazy. And then you try to figure out, well, what am I supposed to use and what am I not supposed to use? If you use developmentally appropriate practice to guide you, you're always on the right path. And this notion of children, if you see them as all curious learners, I want to pause right here. If you see all the children in your care as curious learners, not just the ones that are quiet and compliant, but the ones who sometimes you have to say, Sean, let me hold your hand. Let's do this together. Because you know, if you don't hold my hand, I'm going to what? Not move or go the other way. But if you see that as curiosity, I wonder how it can get you to change your behavior to be more developmentally appropriate around how you're responding to Sean, okay? And my curious drive to know more around the world around me in my classroom environment, my home, the apartment building where I live, the play group I'm coming to, no matter what it is. So if you see that as my mind is absorbent and trying to take in what's around me, here's what you should be offering me. Repetition in those experiences, not one or two times, but hundreds, if not thousands of times for me to be a curious learner around whatever it is related to behavior you want me to what? Achieve. 
not by telling me, but by giving me real hands-on experiences. Because if we don't do that, we create what? Those problems that frustrate us. Then the last piece is that our, our environments, what we have there in our environment, it sends messages to children. It sends messages to children around, take a deep breath and get calm. It sends messages to children around, go buck wild here. It took me years to learn this, that the rugs that I had in my classroom, the colors on the wall for many of the children could be overstimulating and cause them anxiety, cause them stress that they could never articulate, but then they would demonstrate it in their behavior. So for us to really reevaluate those things um, and what teachers would often say is, the room's gonna look boring. The room's gonna look boring. I'm not saying it needs to be sterile white with nothing in the room, but determining the kids in your care or the children at your home, what do you have around them and what's the effect that it has on their behavior is what we're talking about here. What are our expectations for behavior in our classroom? Not our rules, but our expectations and how are we settling, setting them up and how are we modeling them for children? This is that first 45 days of school. And most of the time, this is what a Stanford professor calls the null curriculum. The null curriculum is teacher John knows what the expectations are, but 17 of the kids don't. And we don't know it until we don't do it. And then teacher John says, Sean, you know you're not supposed to do that. That's not it. I didn't know that though. So the expectations need to be where early and often that you're sharing those with me. Then I know what, oh, this is the expectation. The expectation is we walk inside the classroom. So instead of saying, Sean, don't run, you say, Sean, we walk inside the classroom. The other thing that you need to put in there is a picture of Sean or some feet walking and say, remember, Sean, we walk inside the classroom. That's how we prime and map the brain, which is really different than how most of us um, teach children, how most of it was modeled for us and what we actually give children at home and at school. And when they're grounded in social emotional learning around behavior, here are six of the things that children actually get when this happens every single day. They develop high concentration. They develop a sense of completion. If you are last year, Beth and First Five sponsored a series on stressing young children that's on their YouTube page. So I highly recommend there's a four part session. Um, and if you look at the first uh, series, the first video in the series, where you look at Rebecca and Messiah, Messiah goes through the steps of the brain where he's stressed. She gives him some feeling words, he calms down, and then she taps into like the thinking brain, his, his core, prefrontal cortex. And then what happens is he has a, this sense of completion around, I wanna finish what I started. That notion of follow through and self-confidence because there's order that brings out what? The joy in learning. They're all connected. They're all connected if we do this ongoing and continuous. So we're gonna watch a short video if you blink, you're gonna miss it. It's 60 seconds long, but it really looks at chaotic homes. And I wanna give you a, um, a marker before we look at this video. While this research looked at homes, the same notion of chaoticness applies to our classrooms also. So think about that. And then because they targeted hundreds of children whose family's income level was below a threshold, so they call them low income. I want to also caveat that this chaotic home or chaotic classroom applies to all children of all races, all levels of income, all genders, and all ethnicities. Nobody is excluded from this level of chaos and what it does to the developing brain. All right, so let's take a look. Disorganization, noise, and crowding. Family life can be hectic. A new study finds a chaotic home may have a negative effect on kids. Researchers studied more than 380 kids living in poverty and tested their cortisol levels, which are a marker of stress. They found those who lived in homes with more chaos had less emotional regulation, regardless of cortisol levels. Kids in homes without good routines also had trouble controlling their emotions, especially if they had low cortisol levels. Scientists say this suggests both biological and social factors influence a child's emotional development. To make your home less chaotic, create daily routines and stick to them. Have kids wake up, go to bed, and eat at the same time each day. Set out clothes and pack school lunches the night before. Carve out specific times for chores, errands, and fun activities. 
Remember, a good routine could pay off for your child in the long run. I'm Jessica Sanchez reporting. Now, anybody that really paid attention, what did you hear? Did you hear some similarities between what they offered for uh, families at home and some things we do in early learning settings? Can anybody compare one of the things that you heard them recommend families do to things that we do in our classrooms? Did anybody hear anything? Routine. 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 Yes. Definitely routines in that consistent routines. Anything else? Making space for um, fun activities. Mm -hmm. that. You know, organization. Space. Organization, that's right. And you know, effective early learning classrooms have what? A space for everything. And some of you didn't have mothers like I had. So my mother, <laughs> love it enough to get on my last nerve sometimes. So thank you, Jesus. Um, we were taught early that everything in our house had a home. And if it didn't have a home, we had to create a home for it. Or that meant it was trash and we didn't need it. And she meant that. She meant that. So, you know, that meant when we came home, we all had our own bedroom. So your jacket either went in the closet downstairs where we, you know, hung our jackets or it could go upstairs to your room, but it didn't just fall on the floor. It didn't lay on the sofa. It didn't go behind the, the kitchen chair. And she was clear on that. And then what I realized later was, oh, this actually kept our house running a different way um, compared to if we would go to some of our relatives' house and we would all say, it's so crazy there. We were really saying it was chaotic because stuff was everywhere. So, but because she taught us early that everything needed a home and if it didn't have one, we created it. And that's essentially what effective early learning environments do. You set up your classroom and you would create a basket or a shelf for something. And if you don't have a space for it, you switch it out or you wait or you create one. You don't just put it there. And that notion of creating the space for it, we sometimes have to teach parents that and lead them towards that to become effective. All right. So, all right. We went over about 15 minutes before you're supposed to take your break. So I want you all to take... Um, the sign says uh, 10 minute, but let's take a five minute body brain break. And if you read this thing, it says a bunch of things about health. So I advise you all to get up, stand up, move around, get some water, go hug somebody, go step outside and come back in um, five minutes. It's 16 after. Um, so we'll be back in five minutes. All right. I hope people got up and moved around and got some water. There's something to drink, some tea, took a breath of uh, fresh air, open the window, open the door, rub the dogs, kiss the kitten, for those of you who like to do that kind of thing, um, hug the baby, something. Just got up and moved around. That's the important piece. Welcome back, welcome back. Okay, I'm gonna jump right in for those of us who are still on the call. I'm actually putting in the chat box now um, a handout called 20 Questions for Developmentally Appropriate Practice. It's a handout, great handout that you can use for coaching, for um, having um, professional learning communities with your team at your site. Just lots of recommendations there. So before we move forward, there were a few questions that I didn't see earlier that I'm gonna answer now. Um, so someone says, the story about the child experiences for a teacher correct, do you advise for a parent in the same situation? So Franklin, I'm not sure what story you're talking about. I mentioned a few, so forgive me. So if you remind me what story you're talking about, I can offer more clarity. Then Letitia, you said, what if the family doesn't want you to get involved with them? Letitia, that happens every single year. Um, see, a part of teaching and learning as an ongoing process, sp specifically around behavior, is the more we plant seeds, what eventually happens is, and I've had this happen multiple times as a preschool teacher and as a mental health consultant and as a program manager and director, that parents keep hearing the same thing from different bodies of people. Then they eventually say, oh, Ms. Sybil told me that. I heard Ms. Astrid talking about that. Well, Ms. Beth, the mental health consultant that was here before, she said the same thing. So some of our work is planting the seed and we won't see it grow. That's what we trick ourselves. We all, this is that teacher behavior. We, we plant the seed, we wanna see it grow, we wanna see it sprout, we wanna see it become a big tree and we wanna see it produce fruit all before they leave my preschool classroom. That isn't realistic. 
This is how we create problems for ourselves and young children. So planting the seed for some families is individualizing, it's appropriate. Um, and some families don't want you to get involved. They just, they just simply don't. Some families have access to things outside of school. My godson, when he was uh, two and a half, I told Tiffany and Jonathan, I said, so when are you all gonna take him to get his speech assessed? Because they kept saying, well, we understand him. And then one day I couldn't take it anymore. And I said, but the rest of the world can't. And they both looked at me. And I said, I can't understand what he says. He's like, he's babbling. You all understand it because you make yourselves understand it and you hear it every day. So I'm in relationship with them. This is my godson, my legal godson. So I could say that to them. Don't say it to a parent that way. But it was still, they weren't ready to receive the information from the school. Tiffany knew what to do because I told her what to do. She went to his pediatrician and said, I want a global evaluation. I said, the pediatrician is going to say, how do you know what that is? That's going to cost the hospital money. Everything I said to her, the pediatrician said, but because she's one of those kind of mothers that'll just sit there, I don't got nothing else to do today. I took off work. I'm not leaving until I get a referral. She left with a referral. It was a Tuesday in July. His assessment was the following week on a Thursday in San Leandro. There's a power of the pediatrician. Now, you know, when we get stuck up in our Head Start programs, it's four months and children still haven't been assessed. It's ridiculous. Resources and access. So when they say they don't want you to get involved, it could mean they're in denial. It could mean they're receiving services because I've had that happen before where they just didn't want the school to know. And it simply could mean they're still figuring it out. But you bringing it up, you've done due diligence, you provide them with access. You said, here's the information that, uh, Help Me Grow at First Five offers. Here's other information where you can go and get some free screenings, some free assessments, or get new medical coverage, whatever it is, you provided a multitude of options. We've done due diligence um, around the family that may say, we don't want you to get involved. Respect that, respect that is, is, is my whole part of that advice. So great question, Letitia. And it's gonna to happen to you multiple times multiple times. So we're jumping ahead because I'm paying attention to the time, but so this notion of our values, perceptions, and beliefs, they're passed down and onto us about behavior. And this oftentimes when dormant and unconscious, our values are those are the pieces of what we saw and were told that we internalized and we made real about behavior. Some of you heard what I heard, children to be seen and not heard. See, I didn't go to preschool and then I went to a part day kindergarten. So fundamentally my maternal grandmother, Audrey, took care of me in those preschool years. That was the first grandchild. And then three years later, my um, cousin Shanae came along who I love dearly, but it seemed like she cried the first year of her life. I was like, this baby's crying all the time, grandma. Like, could she go back to where she came from? Um, but eventually, you know, she got bigger and she stopped crying, but I went to, a part the kindergarten that I hated, I wanted to just be back with my grandmother. But what I would hear from my grandmother's sister, my Aunt Frida, she would tell her, Audrey, you're going to just spoil that boy. You're going to spoil that boy. And I remember my grandmother telling her, milk spoils, not children. Because my grandmother knew the time and attention she was giving me was needed and necessary, that it was going to be a buffer for when I left her, what the comfort of her home to go to that school and that kindergarten that I hated. But those are the values that we hear that are passed on that holding children, giving children time and attention spoils them. So you don't want to do that. Do it on your own. Become independent. Maybe I am independent, but I, you know what? I just actually feel good when I sit on your lap, Miss Beth, and you read me the story. It feels better. I pay attention more opposed to me sitting on a hard chair or always having to pick the book up by myself. But if that's not my value, it's never going to what? happen and then my unmet need never gets met. Then my perceptions, your perception of who my parents are, they don't want help. Even if it's not real, my parents could just be shy, but it becomes a reality. I shared this yesterday. I told them because we did the we were doing some stuff on temperament. And I said most people read me wrong. I walk into a room, I typically sit by myself, I'm quiet, and I've been people have been call me all kinds of names and say he's standoffish and he's this and he's that. And then when they get to know me, I said, I'm none of those things. I'm actually shy. 
my temperament is very shy. And people always say, Sean, you a liar. That's a lie from hell. You are not shy. I am. But for work, I show up differently. But if I walk into a space where I know no one, this is my first time there, I typically sit to the side or sit in the back. If I feel like it's too large and I sit in the front, because if I sit in the back, it's hard for me to track. The older I get, my eyes get more messed up. So I have to sit in the front. But it's really that shy four-year-old that still shows up throughout my life because our temperament stay the same, but our personalities change. What I've learned as an adult is to develop what? Some tools, how to respond to my shyness. But your perception of a child in their family becomes your reality, even if it's incorrect. Then this other part about our beliefs, your beliefs about child development, are they accurate or are they incorrect? Your beliefs about discipline really show up around how you respond. Your expectations around what children should do, how they should behave, what they should say and not say, all show up around behavior. So we've got to figure out a way to really grapple with our values, our perceptions, and our beliefs when it comes to behavior in developmentally appropriate ways. So I'm gonna ask you four broad questions. I want you to think about it and Maya said, that's me as well, okay? I want you to think about it around what were you taught around? Were you taught to identify and understand and express your emotions? Yes or no? Put it in the chat box. Y for yes, N for no. Were you taught, think back to being two, three, four, five, and six to identify, understand, and express emotions. I see no, Asaki said no, Pat said no, Darcel said no, Martha said no, Dana said no, Ashley said no, John said no, Leticia said no, Namaya said no, Martina said no, Yolanda said no, Lorena said no, Jasmine said no, Astrid said no, Kim said no, Jesus, Christmas, did somebody get it? Somebody say yes, somebody lie. Beth, put a yes in there, lie to us, lie to us. Somebody, Maria said no, Guadalupe said a little bit. All right, Guadalupe, Carolyn said no, Elizabeth said no. Lord, somebody, Guadalupe gave us a little bit. All right, Marika said no. Jackie said yes, she probably lying. Um, Nora said no. Patrice said to express myself, yes. Okay, John said, okay, yes, I'm a lie. Um, Dominique Franklin said no. Beth said, okay, yes, a lie. <laughs> See, most of us were not taught this, but then we're expected to teach children this. This is a big gap. So we've got to slow down and begin to teach ourselves. And I'm transparent. I had to do it. My parents taught me a lot and gave me a lot, but this level of expressing emotion and feeling, I was not explicitly taught. It was modeled in certain ways, but I was not explicitly taught it. If we don't do it ourselves, then we can't teach it to children, all right? Were you directly taught how to express emotions in healthy ways? Yes or no? Were you directly taught how to express emotions in healthy ways? Pat said no, Asaki said no, Franklin said yes. All right, we got not directly time said no, no, lots of no's. Third question, were there some emotions that you weren't supposed to feel or weren't allowed to express? Were there some emotions that you weren't supposed to feel or weren't allowed to express? Lots of people are saying yes. So our final one, are there some emotions you're comfortable with now? Jai said, yes, anger and indignation. Okay, <laughs> Arthur said fear, <laughs> sadness and anger. Anger, Namaya said anger, okay. And Helica said better. Nora said sadness and anger. Are there some, are you comfortable with some emotions now? And if yes, what are they? So Guadalupe said all feelings are valid, but Guadalupe is either a therapist or she'd been to some of those teaching pyramid trainings. <laughs> all feelings are valid. Yes, they are, Guadalupe. Um, I'm saying yes with therapy. Me too, me too, I'm there. Martha said, I'm comfortable with all my feelings. That's great. All right. So we went through this short exercise to really get like, most of us didn't get those things in those first three and we had to go through a different process to become comfortable with emotions. Yet as teachers and as parents and as family members, we're responsible for doing those first things with children. 
So if it wasn't modeled and taught to us, what are we going to do? What's the plan? This is the action plan. You need to write this down. What am I going to do to begin to teach children how to identify, understand, and express emotions in the context of my early learning program or classroom? And your answer can't be, I'm going to use teaching pyramid. That's way too broad. Or I'm going to use the second step violence prevention curriculum. You know, I'm going to blow the dust off of it and take it from under the shelf. I don't know where they are. I've been in your classrooms. That's not an answer. What are you going to explicitly do? What are you going to explicitly do to help children identify, understand, and express emotions? I want you to think about that for a moment. Then I want you to put your answer in the chat. If you're a mental health consultant, if you're a program manager, if you're a coach, if you're a Senate director, if you're a teacher, if you're the cook in a kitchen, if you're a parent, what are you going to explicitly do to help children identify, understand, and express emotions? What are you going to do? What are you going to do to help them gain those skills and experiences every day? Maria said, I'm going to encourage them to talk. All right. Kavita said she's going to read books, bring visuals and games. John said he's going to place visuals of emotions. Darcel said, practice and model with them during play. All right, Darcel. Guadalupe said, be more mindful in my interactions. Ruby said, be curious. Okay, Ruby. Martha said, I'm going to learn how to regulate myself first before. Martha, you my friend. Maria said, we're going out for a drink, Martha, when I get comfortable <laughs> being around people. I hope you drink red, red wine, Martha. If you don't, you can just get some ice water because I drink red wine. Ashley said, be patient and model with them even if they make mistakes. Caroline said she's going to use Mark Brackett's ruler approach. Don't tell Dina Simmons, but that's a whole nother story. Um, uh, model good behavior. The ruler approach for folks who are there is, it's just another approach, like teaching pyramid is one, conscious discipline is one, incredible years. That's just a whole nother one out of, out of Yale. Um, Sybil said relationship first. I missed some of them there. Um, making children feel Model my identifying my own name, create a talking circle to create puppets. All right, Martina. Listening to children when they talk, teach them, listening when they're comfortable, let them know if feelings okay, helping them label emotions, trust first. All right, there were a few I really, really liked up here, Beth. So I really liked um where was it? Uh where I said it already. Guadalupe said, be more mindful in my interactions with children. Guadalupe. You one of our winners today, you want a gift card. I love that answer. Martha Gamboa, you said, I'm going to learning to regulate myself first before helping children. Martha, you a winner. Y'all gotta email me for y'all gift card. Martha, that is the central core of it all that we've got to do it first before we want children to do it. And most times we skip over that. If we don't do it, Martha, the children can't really get it. So that is really the starting place, Martha. That is the answer of the year, us doing it first and then asking children to do it. Thank you for that. Uh, this is Martha. I just want to say thank you. Not well. I love the card, but I do like the fact that I I can uh, share with you what I have planned because um, I have learned about three years ago. I've been learning how to regulate myself around everybody. I am learning how to have a healthy relationship with everybody, not just with children. And I have learned in the past that. The way that I am, that's what I want to teach it, the children. And that's wrong because the way that I was raised, it was wrong. Even though, like you said, I love my parents, but it was wrong. And I wanted to teach the children the way I learned. Um, and, and it was wrong. And I don't like it, especially now after the pandemic. We have a lot of children with a lot of emotional uh, dilemmas. And then we, I am an adult with a lot of emotional dilemmas. So I know that I have to figure out myself first before I transfer my emotions or my daily living to the children. So thank you for uh, asserting that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martha. Awesome. I appreciate that. All right. So Martha and um, who else? It was someone else. Email me and I'll um, get you your e-gift your, your e card. So building positive relationships. I already talked about my grandmother. This notion of time and attention is research-based. It is research-based. So earlier, we're getting into the strategies now. Uh, and I'm paying attention to time, so I don't wanna keep you all. So this notion of visual supports, visual schedules in our classrooms or pictures even at home, they help children. It was one of the things that I brought to my godson and his parents at the time, God bless them, because uh, we had so many different conversations about him. 
you know, I remember Tiffany's actually pregnant with Madison, who's three. And she said, we're not going to do all of that because I came with all the stuff. And was like, this is what you do when he wakes up. This is how you help him get dressed. This is what you're doing your way out the door. And she was just like, I got two other kids and I'm pregnant. We're not doing all of that. And um, they, they didn't, but I'm smarter than them. So I tricked them. I did a training in Pleasant Hill. And I said, hey, I'm at this training. I want you, it was all for families. I want you to read what I gave them. And as a parent, tell me if these things work for you. And I know the stuff works. So I gave one to her, gave one to Jonathan. She called me the next day. She says, this other hand out here, we're trying this stuff on Shola and it's working. And in my mind, I was like, because I'm smarter than you. I knew it was going to work. It was what I was trying to get you to do all along, but I had to trick her into using it. She knows I tell the story all the time now. And she always says, you need to pay me and my kids for using all of our real stories in your workshops and your trainings. <laughs> and I, like, I buy them stuff all the time. I'm paying them back. All right. So here's the thing about visuals. Children and adults, we remember 80 to 85% of what we see. When you're driving down the street, there's a reason why you stop. Because some of you think, how did I get to the corner? You saw that stop sign and the way it's in your brain told you to slow down. We remember 10% of what we hear. So Kevin stopped running, Jamal don't do that, Nevea don't hit, it's largely ineffective. And this is research-based. Children benefit from visual reminders. Those are pictures of what the expected behavior is, not the behavior you don't want them to do. Pictures of the expected behavior that can happen at home and school because they provide support. They provide a lot of support. So three questions for you. How do you know what speed to drive when you're driving down the street? How do you know what speed to drive? Put it in the chat box quickly. How do you know what speed to drive? The sign, that's right, man. How do you know what food to select when you get to the grocery store? But she said grocery list, repetition, the list, the menu. Okay, so for that, those, those are real sophisticated people there. Most of us know what food to select because the box in the picture looks the same. We don't even read it. It could say less salt and I wouldn't know because if the picture's the same, I'm picking up the same stuff when I'm in Trader Joe's. That's what most of us do. How do you know how to build Ikea furniture? Nobody really does. Don't even try to answer that. We just get it together somehow through there. But all of this around visuals has a research base. What we find is that young children's anxiety can get reduced, their tantrums reduce, acting out goes away and dissipates, misunderstandings turn into understandings, and dependence on the teacher's verbal prompts go away when we use pictures and visual supports as relevant supports to support young children. All right? So now that we'll give you some, um, three big ones that often come up around challenging behavior for folk. This notion of tantrums. So what you see on the screen here is how to respond to the tantrum, all right? These are all points around how to respond to a tantrum um, if you have a child who's having a tantrum. So this next slide is really, and if you go to the uh, YouTube, to the first five Alameda YouTube page, there's a whole presentation with this slide in it around the difference between a tantrum and a meltdown in that four part series. And I really just want you all to understand the difference between the tantrum and the meltdown. So essentially the tantrum and the meltdown can look alike. I can scream, kick, stomp, swear, bite. Those are all behaviors that we both may demonstrate. But if I'm having the tantrum and Beth is having the meltdown, my tantrum is goal-directed around something that I want. Best meltdown is her internal re reaction to her overwhelm and overload that she is not in control over. Fundamentally, this is how they're different. And we've got to understand that around the difference between a child going into a tantrum that can be prevented and going into a meltdown that can be prevented also. But the warning signs look different and our response have to be different, okay? Really, really important. Um, and I wanna unpack that completely, but if you go to the, uh, the website and the YouTube page, you hear us going into, well, hear us, hear me going into detail about this. Um, I think it's in session two, Beth, or session three, I don't remember, but it's, it's on the first five Alameda YouTube page. 
the whole session where I go into detail more about the different yeah. and strategies. I, related I posted to the link in the chat to the YouTube channel. Thank you, Beth. She's so awesome. I got to take Beth on the road with me. She's the perfect person that I need with me. I'm ready. What'd you say, Beth? You say ready. I'm ready. Okay. So there's another strategy that I want you to all to use with all children, but specifically when you're thinking of children who have those like percolating up challenging behaviors. So this strategy is called Holmes. It wasn't created by me. It was created by another, um, another woman. Um, and Holmes stands for hands-on, open-ended, meaningful, engaging, and sensory oriented. Really, really effective. So if you're a specialist, if you work um, with individualized children, a mental health consultant, a teacher in inclusion class, a teacher in the non-inclusion class, if you have four students, if you have 24, the home strategy works. So think about how you're planning experiences. Remember, that's what makes it developmentally appropriate. Remember, how are you planning for things being challenging yet achievable? Is it hands-on? Or does Ms. Ruby only get to touch the book and touch the puppet? And we just got to kind of look at it and think about what the puppet in the book feel like. What activity can I experience fully on? Is it open-ended or does it have a fixed way to use this? Or is it open-ended where I can be really curious and the outcome isn't determined by the material, but determined by me? Is it meaningful? I just shared this story yesterday. I was in Emory Reveal one day um, it, during a, a coaching session and the teacher had that lakeshore snow and I'll never forget this. And she was trying to demonstrate the snow. She was mixing it in front of the children. None of them could touch it. Most of them had never seen or touched snow before. So it wasn't meaningful. It was beyond them. And because I think there's somebody else greater than I, a fire truck pulled up outside. And like eight of the kids were like, fire truck. And they got up and kind of went to the door and went to the window. So I'm looking at her like, OK, stop. Tell everybody, let's go all go look at the fire truck, because that's what I would have done. But she was saying, come back, come back. She put the little bucket down. Get back over here. Johnny, come back. Sean, come back. Michael, come back. No, we're, we're going to. It turned into that for like five minutes. And then when I couldn't take anymore, I, and I don't do this all the time, only with people I know, I kind of got up and just opened the door to the yard, which is right there, and stood there. And the kids kind of came out. The other teacher got up and went out. I kind of looked at the teacher and smiled. I know she was thinking, I can't stand this short, fat man but she didn't say it out loud. She may have said it in her head and that's okay. That's where it needed to stay. Kids went out, the fire truck was at the gate. So of course the firemen were like, hey kids, how are you? They did that fireman thing. Um, then of course, what one of the kids said, can I get on the fire truck? And the fireman said, of course. So the teacher outside said four kids at a time. Only the teacher's still inside the room, she's mad. It was a meaningful experience. What she should have done was what started creating what curriculum around that. It was meaningful and real to them, not the fake snow. It's really, really important around behavior. And when it's not meaningful to young children, how they can disengage. So the next one is all about engagement. What about your activity and your experience, your interaction that's hands-on, open-ended, meaningful, and has a high sense of engagement? And for many children, um, I would say in sometimes all, what aspects of not just our first five senses, but our seven, and now they're talking about their eight senses. Well, they might say, how meaningful is snow in California? Well, if you're in Northern California, you may experience it, but pretty much in the Bay Area and Southern California, unless your family have access to get you there, you probably won't see it until you're much older. You know, like some of the, um, how do I say this? Some of the sites that I've coached and trained in, Oakland, um, they close down for a week and they every year the whole school goes to the ski resort. So those children all what experience snow, but most of their mamas work as doctors and lawyers for Apple and um, at Kaiser. So this is a different income where they can afford to do that and the whole school goes. Most of the programs that I've worked at as a preschool teacher most of us teaching couldn't afford to do that for a whole week, let alone just the children and families. So there's a group who may be able to do that, but largely many of the children and some of us as adults, those aren't everyday experiences that we have, okay? They're not everyday experiences. Um, and then that sensory oriented, not just to see, hear, smell, and touch, but pre-perceptive. Am I able to use my whole body 
to learn, you know? And then what happens when all of my senses are activated at the same time? Because then that's a whole nother sense. Um, and in one of the uh, stress and children trainings that we did last year, I think it was in module four, I talk about that where I use the example of baking cookies and the cookies catching on fire and how it activates every sense. And when you can respond to all of your senses being activated at one time, for some of us, um, it pushes us over the top in terms of overwhelm. And for some of us, it doesn't push us over the top. It just kind of makes us uh, percolate up. But we need to know that around what sensory experiences we're offering to children, or if our environment has no sand and water and clay, and how we need to bring that back into the environment because they have a direct effect on behavior. The next one is about anxiety. So the first three points you see here are things that we need to look for as adults around developing anxiety in young children. And then the last five bullets that are in bold and have the red dot, these can be our responses to children in our care who may be developing anxiety. Now, here's the caveat. I'm not asking you to play therapist. So don't say, Sean told me. That is not what I'm saying. And it's on the record. We're recording this. I am never giving you permission to pretend that you're a licensed play therapist. That's not what I'm saying. But Dr. Neil Horn says, one need not be a therapist to be therapeutic. I'll say it again. One need not be a therapist to be therapeutic. That means anybody can take on behaviors that are helpful to any and all children that have a therapeutic tenant or base to them. That's what these strategies are about, okay? So knowing what the signs are and what to look for, knowing things that we can do, and then saying, you know, hey, we need to contact Beth, our mental health consultant. We need her support and help here in being able to move um, towards that as, as the next step. And the third one is this notion of hitting. This one is a really big one. And I already shared with you all the example when a little girl said, my mama said, if somebody hits me to hit them back um, and me not knowing what to do at the time um, and getting to that point later in my career around not just teaching emotions and modeling emotions, um, me learning not to take it personally, that the children aren't necessarily talking to me, they're advocating for themselves. And that my job and responsibility was to set up in the environment multiple opportunities for them to practice their responses when they wanted to hit. I gave you the example earlier of the two little boys. You know, his last response was, should I go snatch it? And you can tell me, he, you can, his face told me he really didn't believe that's what he should do. But had I said, well, yeah, go snatch it, he would have done it as his third and final, you know, kind of choice with this notion of practicing waiting, delaying gratification, being patient as a response is oftentimes what most of us have been robbed of. We don't have a lot of practice in it, so we can't afford it to children. So figuring out what that is, being really, really um, specific and concrete about it um, and not making our goals broad, but really specific around um, what it is we're, we're, we're going to do to help children gain those skills. So one of the things that I often tell teachers to go to, so there's so many resources that we use in early childhood. So there are two that I really, really like that most of you are familiar with. The inventory of practice, the infant and toddler one or the preschool one. I think it's a great resource. It seems overwhelming because there's so many pages, but if your issue is teaching emotions, what Gail Joseph did with that inventory of practice, I think is great. Go to that one section and there may be five or six things there. Those five or six pieces tell you explicitly how things we should be doing to teach emotions. That's what we need. And just drill down with those. You know, Rick Hansen in Marin, if he told me nothing else, he told me just one thing, Jot, just one thing. So I'm not gonna create four goals. I'm not even gonna create two. It's just that one goal of me teaching emotion language over the course of what, 45 days consistently then I'm gonna step back and assess it to see, did my children gain anything? What more could I add? What do I need to reteach and redo? That's that work of developmentally appropriate practice around behavior. So that's the first resource. The other resource that I think is a great resource is that same sheet that tell me what to do instead sheet. It's in English and Spanish. 
one's for families and the other one's for classroom staff. It's a great resource that I think we overlook around responding to these behaviors because we'll do it once or twice and then we kind of surrender it and give up. But we need to do it, what, for two months. Then it becomes a practice that I've embedded for myself. Then it also becomes this experience that children have had and it's a developmentally appropriate practice instead of an inappropriate practice. Then at the bottom here, just some responses. This is, an, this is not an exhaustive list of what we can offer children, things like pushing the wall, mashing clay. Um, and this pushing the wall one, I've actually switched it. I saw this one teacher do it and I was like, that's a great idea where her and her children actually climb the wall. There's a space where they put their feet on the wall and their hands on the floor and they kind of climb the wall backwards. I was like, this is fantastic. Um, I may not want to do it every day, but I thought it was a great experience that I uh, would offer children around a response to that agitation where they, they want to hit. Let me, okay, I see some things in the chat. Can you see this a PowerPoint presentation? Um, definitely, so when Leah, everyone who registered and attended, you're going to get a, um, a link from Leah to evaluate and then all the handouts link will be there from Leah, definitely. That's not, oh, Leah's back. That's, that's not a problem. You'll definitely all get that. So don't, don't worry about that at, at all. I think I have that slide in here, Beth. So for those who aren't familiar, even though I think many of you are, this is what it looks like that teach them what to do instead. This is the parent side. And then there is a, um, I mean, this is the teacher side. And then there's a parent one. I think I have it. I can put it in the chat box right now for folk. Um, I just happen to have it on my desktop. Um, there it is. So it's in the chat box. There's a two-sided handout, one side for families, the other side for um, staff. Great, great resource, developmentally appropriate, and easy, easy um, read. And the other piece for those of you who um, need more convincing as we come to our last six minutes, we actually have research that says there's a way to change children's behavior and the ways not to change children's behavior. So everything you see here on the screen is research-based around what we need to do daily throughout the day and interactions by all the adults multiple times using it as it was intended. On the short end, it takes about five weeks. That's about 45 days, y'all. On the long end, 12 weeks, that's about three months to change behavior depending upon how intensive it is um, to change the behavior. What link didn't you get, Namaya? So she said you didn't get the link. I'm not sure what link we're talking about. One you just mentioned. Um, yeah, the one that you just mentioned, I didn't get that link. Oh, the, or so did you that, put it up? No, Leah's going to send the um, link after oh. the meeting. No, okay. I just, what I just put in the chat box was the one handout. Okay. Well, I didn't you'll get be, that link. Yeah, you'll be getting the link in your email after the training is over. So okay. you'll, you'll get it in the email that you use to register and the email. Okay. But yeah, it'll come through okay. to your email. Thanks, Beth. Okay, thank you. You bet. Great question. So as we pull up on the rear, our last five slides, Beth, Leah, and everyone, um, I just love this quote. Play is an optimal way to learn. It's an optimal way to learn. So an aspect of a developmentally appropriate practice is um, this notion of play. So I'm just gonna quickly go over five times of play that you should make sure that the children that you teach and care for or the children in your home have access to. The first, first notion is physical play. And oftentimes is we start to restrict physical play because we um, are afraid of risk. And here's what I like to tell adults in the United States. Risk is a developmental necessity. I'll say it again. Risk is a developmental necessity. The vast majority of children seek it out. It is our job to prevent hazards from being in their environment. It is not our job to prevent risk. What we do is we juxtapose risk and hazard and make them synonymous. Risk and hazard are not the same. Now, we can't go too deep in that because we only got four minutes left, but physical play is a necessity. Physical play actually calms children and any good physical therapist um, will tell you who's worth a nickel or a dime that if this is the child's brain, this is the brain, this is the base of the brain, and this is what their spine, the spine goes down and you know, it curves up like this at the base of where our, our, our butt begins. 
but it's bent up. So the spine doesn't start off this way. The spine wants them to wiggle and move. So we move to then rest and become this. So this notion of physical play, children should be moving early, often, and ongoing as a part of development. When we restrict the physical play, we create multiple opportunities for behaviors that challenge us. I'll say it again. The more you restrict physical play, you create behaviors that challenge us as adults. So my recommendation is don't just tell children to play, play with them to the capacity that you can withstand it. That's my recommendation, play with them. There's a big body physical play needed and necessary every single day. It's an antidote to challenging behavior, not just for three-year-olds, I got an 18 year old, two 17 year olds, a 12 year old who will be 13 next month and a 13 year old who are often together, they're brothers and cousins. And sometimes it gets really loud and it becomes really contentious where they wanna hit each other over that stupid video game that they're all playing together. So sometimes I gotta open the door and say, everybody cut it off. Then it gets real quiet. Cause they're like, cut it off. The world is coming to an end. Put your sneakers on. Somebody underarm smell bad cause it stinks in this room. Put your shirts on, we're all coming outside. I have to do it repeatedly. They're like, come on, uncle, come on. Don't come on, uncle me. Now mind you, they're all taller than me. I'm the shortest one in the family. They're all taller than me. I got cousins who are 15 and he's six, seven. That's how tall he is, but he's only 15. But they know not to try me. Come on outside. I need everybody to just run around, run up and down the block, get some fresh air. And what they end up doing, is coming back and you can feel that everybody's body has shifted and changed because they don't know we've been sitting down too long in here playing this game. We've been on Zoom school all day. We need to actually get outside and move our bodies around. So my brother got tired of because they're all at his house. So what they have to do now in the summer every day, the 16 year old who actually drives too, he basically gets up, he gets his brothers up, they go pick up his cousin and they go to the gym for two hours at eight o'clock in the morning every day. We get them out the house first thing in the morning to start the day different. And what we've noticed is they're not playing the videos games as much because they have to get up. Then when they come back, you know what most of them are doing? Taking a long little nap because they're moving their body in this way as teenagers that young children need also. The next form of play that we need to provide children with is this notion of playing with objects materials, things in their environment. These can be sensory. Um, it's the first part of how we take in the world around us. Then when we play with those objects, symbolic play takes over. We start to make sense of them, have fantasy play with them, um, turn the block into something different using language. All of this becomes settling to what? Our social emotional development. And then, oh, it's three o'clock. So we're on the next to the last slide, Beth. So if you've got to go, thank you, but this is the next to the last slide. This notion of pretend and social dramatic play. And we have them both there because this notion of pretend play, pretend play is based in fantasy. That means it's not real. Social dramatic play is based in reality, all right? So they're both valid and real, but what you'll have is some children love pretend play. It's totally fine. Other children will come to school and they're reenacting everything that happened in their house yesterday. Both real, both therapeutic, both we should allow and want that to happen early and ongoing because it has a direct impact on what behavior. And the fifth one, if you have older children, because I know some of you work, I know a lot of my friends at OUSD, part of the day they're with preschoolers and then in the other part of the day they're with school age children, um, but games with rules, preschoolers need games with rules as a kindergarten readiness marker. How can I sit here and play this game of checkers with Beth? How can I sit here and play Candyland with Leah as a developing skill, not just for play, but for what externalized and internalized responses to what socialization? All, these are all strategies. In our last slide, learning is not a spectator sport. So I encourage you all as adults in early childhood education to play early, play often, and play with the young children in your lives. Thank you all for taking time this morning to spend two hours with us. Thank you for your time and attention. And I promise you the time and attention will not spoil you. It will make you richer and better. Have a great, great rest of your day.
Oh, thank you so much, Sean. It's always such a pleasure to hear uh, to hear your words and to get inspired. We appreciate it so much. Um, and I appreciate everybody for coming. It's just been wonderful training this morning. Please remember to fill out your evaluation so that we know what other trainings you're interested in, what else you want to uh, us to bring Sean back and have him train some more. We do have a have a contract with them for this year, so we will be bringing him back for it. But we really want to know what other stuff you want to hear. So we're going to say goodbye. 